We are in a series entitled, Where Are You Headed? Because every one of us in life are going somewhere. The only question is, is are we going somewhere on purpose? In other words, are you going through life with a design to your life or by default? In other words, other people or just what happens to come in front of you, what is determining the trajectory of your life. And that, I think, is so important for all of us, is to actually think about where we are going in life. And, uh, and I don't mean just on a spiritual level, although that is the ultimate um, consideration, but on our financial journey, our emotional journey, our relational journey, our educational journey, um, whatever it might be, our health journey, that, uh, that we are on one that actually we have chosen. It's not one that we are just going through haphazardly. And so I want us to kind of take that into consideration, to think about it, and over these next few weeks, to actually, hopefully, to come at it from different angles and, uh, and for us to at least get it, and more importantly, to, to remember it at the most crucial times in our life. It is, last week we entitled it, The Principle of the Path. You could have the law of the lane or the rule of the road, <laughs> whatever you want, whatever takes for him, but what, what we need to understand is that it does apply to every area of our life, and it is important for us, and that our intention does not determine the direction of our life. We can have in good intentions, but actually be on a path that's taking us somewhere completely different, and I don't know if you've ever been like that in, in life. I have uh, done that, whether it's I've been out walking um, or I've uh, been driving somewhere and realized that although I intended to go one place, I ended up somewhere else. And so when you do that driving, you're probably only going to be out a few minutes or a few hours. But actually, if you get on the wrong path in life, you can be years out of kilt and have to make some major corrections in a life. And so... The question is that we're asking ourselves is, how do I know which path to be on? On which path should I take? For the simple reason, we don't want to do things in our 20s that in our 30s we regret. We don't want to be in our 40s or our 50s and wish we had taken a different path in our 30s. But if we actually decide to look ahead to even get some binoculars and, as it were, look where, as far as you possibly can ahead and consider your life in that light of where you intend to be. Now, of course, once you give your life to Jesus, your, the, your length of what you're going to have, the focal point for your um, binoculars is not going to be 60, 70, 80, 90 years it is going to be eternity. So you're going to live the now in light of eternity. So that kind of changes the landscape. But if you're not a Christian, if you've never made that commitment to Christ, then obviously you can only look to where life is going to be for this period. And so I believe it's important for us because it's so easy for us to wish that we were going in one direction or even be praying about going in one direction, and yet, maybe unintentionally, on a path that's going in a completely different direction to us. Yes? And so we have got to understand that. And so I want us to have the courage to ask some questions of ourselves, and if you will ask them honestly, and that's the key, because we could ask ourselves the question, and then what happens is, is we go into answering it, but making up excuses. Where actual fact, if we're truly honest with ourselves, we would come to a different conclusion. And then we've got to act on 
our, on, the, on the, uh, the, the outcome of our question. And that's so important, is to ask, to be honest, and then to do something about it. And that is the process that we want to look at. And so today I'm going to look at two questions that are quite related, but we will look at other questions that would be good for us, uh, great questions that would be good for us to particularly ask at times in our life when we are going to make some significant decisions, when we have got a turn in the road uh, to, to make. And the first question that we're going to ask is really about uh, a maturity question. And uh, where's maturity? It's somewhere on there. Um, and it's, the, it's, it's quite simply this question, what is the wisest thing for me to do? What would be the wise thing to do? A simple question. But in, in, in the midst of these things, we often don't take the wise option. And the second question that I'm going to ask uh, for us to ask ourselves is, what story do I want to tell? What story do I want to tell? So those are the two questions that I'm going to look at today, and then we'll look at some others over the coming, coming weeks. You see, it is amazing how many times we listen to people tell their story. In fact, whenever anybody asks you a question so often, they're wanting to know your story. When you come to this church and you're, you're new here, we want to know your story. We want to know what brought you here, why you're here, what you aim to get out of it, what's, what's been, because there's been every decision that you've made has brought you to this place today, whether you're here in the room or whether you're online listening. God has brought you to this place. You're in this place, and there are all sorts of things that are part of your life story that bring you to this place. And so whenever you're talking through your past, that's your story. Whether it's a good story or a bad story, I want you to know there are stories in my life, there are chapters in my life, which I don't want anybody to ask about. Okay? So don't ask. <laughs> but I'm sure you're the same. In other words, so what I want us to do is not that we don't make mistakes, but the issue is, is let's look and think, how can we now make some wise choices? How can we go from here and change the story of our life so that we're no longer running on a story of just what's in the now, but we're thinking, what do we want to tell our children? What is the story we want to tell our children? And I believe that is so important for us in the, in the, in the, in the midst of this. And so, if you've asked somebody a question and somebody's kind of telling you their story... And, uh, and somebody's got into a mess. Often, I don't know about you, but you're, when you're listening to the story, you already kind of know the ending even before you get to the ending so often, yes? But in the midst of that, one of the questions that we often would ask ourselves is, well, did you not see this coming? And of course, the answer is, well, yes, I did have some people talk to me about this, and they did mention it, but... But in the midst of mentioning that, I really didn't, I didn't really think that would be for me. I didn't think that would happen to me. I thought that although um, I made that decision, I, I thought I could handle it. I thought I could cope. I thought that, uh, that, that I would be able to change things later on. And so we do see it coming, and, and often we see it coming in our own life, but sometimes we choose to ignore it in our own life, don't we? Well, last week I asked you to memorize a scripture. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 12, or Proverbs 22 and verse 3. Um, okay, so for those of you that, uh, that memorize Proverbs 27, verse 12, and anybody memorize? Because I, you, you, you don't mind me picking on you? <laughs> no, I won't do that to you. And those that memorize Proverbs 22, and verse 3, it's exactly the same verse. There's no difference, so whether you're in one place or the other thing. So I think if God repeats it, it must be important. But actually, it has been very helpful to me in my life. 
uh, is thinking through this, that when you see this verse, it really does uh, impact your life. It's kind of a very simple proverb that's in there, uh, bringing out a principle that if we actually apply it to our life, it will help us. Yes? And uh, the, in the NLT, it says, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Now, the JHV version is slightly different. I put it, the wise person sees danger and takes refuge. But the Wally keeps going, has an ostrich mentality, and thinks he or she can defy the odds, but suffers the consequences. Now, whatever version and however you want to put it for yourselves, the implications are quite simple. Wise, look ahead. Fools, don't bother. And that's, that's the simplicity of that verse. There are two responses in this verse, the wise response and the foolish response, there are, which, which is two kinds of people. There are, there are three kinds of per people in the, in the world. There is, there's good people, there's foolish people, and there's evil people, yes? So we're not going to go down the evil route, but we, we realize it's so easy for us to be foolish at times, yes? And it's all about the way that we approach our life. And so a wise person will ask themselves this question. What is the wise thing for me to do in light of what I see coming ahead? In other words, in light of my future, in light of my dreams, in light of my hopes, is this decision and the outcome of this decision, if I choose this way, Will it take me in that direction? Or is that what I'm hoping and dreaming and, and, and wanting to go, but in actual fact, this is my choice? And often we don't look at things in that way. I'm sure you've heard it a million times, but the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. And we often do that, don't we? You see, because the naive, the simple, or, or the, the, the wally, as I would say, the, when we are in that kind of mode, when we are being naive, the problem is, is we don't connect the dots. We don't realize that one life event connects to another life event that connects to another life event. In other words, our life is like dominoes. You take one domino, and when, whichever way you go, it's like, you know, when you go in the domino, sometimes they have them to go one, two, three ways, all that, don't they? One domino can send it off in different paths. Well, you've got to think if you've got the domino of your life, and in each area of your life, it is going to go off in different areas. The the question is, is when it comes to finances, you've got, am I going to go this way, am I going to go that way? And it depends in life, the decision that which domino you choose, because it becomes a path. And it will go wherever it, wherever it takes you on, the, on that path of dominoes. If you went on a savings path, it will send you on that. If you go on a debt path, it will go on another way. So in other words, what it is, the same with relationships. If you go on a relationship path and, uh, and you've got the dominoes, do I move in or do I move out? Do I stay? or do I go, whatever it might be, then you've got to realize your decisions are like dominoes and they're going to affect other things. They're not just going to affect you, they're going to affect your generations. It's going to affect your kids, it's going to affect your family, it's going to affect people in the workplace. Whatever decision you make, private decisions have public consequences. So the things that you do in the private is going to affect at some point or other on, on a public sphere. So, for example, like you can do it now, and then in generations you will see something happen and, and something change as a result of that. But it's so important for us to realize that we need to change our habits, to change our thinking, to change our schedules, to change our address if needed, but to change the direction of our Life. Now, it never fails to amaze me that I can preach, I can preach however long I preach, 
I hope your clocks are stopped and you think it's still only 10 o'clock, okay? But I can preach. Anybody can preach. But what fails to amaze me is people going to me go, yes, pastor, that was a great message. Yes, that's great. Oh, wonderful. And they go, on. I'm going to do this. And people write on the connect cards, I'm going to do this, do this, and this. And then they walk out the door and it doesn't make a blind bit of difference. In other words, there's a hearing, there's an accepting, there's a, yeah, I should do, but there's no action. So in other words, if you will ask yourself the question, honestly, in other words, is this the wise thing to do? You might want to add on the end, really? Because so often we say, oh, that's the wise thing to do, but we do all think, is it really the right thing to do? So you and I have got to think through the consequences of what we're doing. So today, what I'm glad is, today now, you've heard that, you're all going to go out of here and you're going to put it into action. (laughs) Some people hear a message on love, but then go out and they're unloving. People hear a message on giving and don't give. And people hear a message on on witnessing to the friends, but they don't witness to the friends. So what I'm saying is, is, is not, if you're here for a happy clappy, if you're here and you're thinking, I want my ears to twitch. If you're here thinking, okay, I want God to speak to me. I want you to know that God will speak to you, but he's not going to say what you want to hear. He's going to hear, speak what you need to hear and so that you can act on it. But we have a want. God, I want you to prophesy into my situation. And God often speaks into our situation. So he could get you out of debt just like that. He could get you out of that relationship just like that. He could get you a new job just like that. He can do anything. There is nothing wrong with the ability of God. There's nothing. But I'll tell you what, if he just kept bailing us out, we would never learn. We would not learn that there are consequences to our actions. And every action that we have has consequences. And we've got to learn that. And we've got to get a hold of it. So being wise means that you, in fact, when you're on the road of life, it means that when you see a warning sign that says, stop, bridge broken, bridge missing, whatever it might be, you don't carry on and think, Ah, it's an old sign. It's not applied to look. Everybody else is going this way. We're all going. We're all going. Well, just because everybody else is going doesn't mean to say you should go, does it? And so often we see a warning, but if you're wise, you stop two miles up before the head. You don't wait till you get to the edge and you've got the front wheels off like they do in the movies. And they're going, what do I do? And I'm clinging oh, home. Maybe that's how some of us live our life. You know, yeah, on the edge, (laughs) absolutely. And so it's important for us to realize that today, God wants you to change, but he wants you to do something tangible with that change, to change the way you think, and that's easier said than done, but to think about it. So in other words, if connect group is an option, that's the way you think. But if connect group is priority in your life, then you're going to be there unless something stops you being there. Whereas if it's an option, you're not going to be there unless something in your life causes you to be there. And that's how different people respond to life and look at life. But I want to say to you, the whole point of being in a connect group and being in relationship with other people is so that when there is danger, there's somebody to travel and to guide you and to help you and to cover you and to, and to support you and to be there with you through the problems. But it's no point, I've got a problem, pastor, and nobody's been to visit me. Well, who have you visited while you were able to visit? Who have you got a relationship with? Oh, well, I don't go anywhere. So what I'm saying is the steps. So people come to the pastor and they want, or the counselor probably more appropriately, and they want a solution. And I talked about this last week, so you can go back to that one and I'll answer it for you on that. But the issue is, whatever the principle is, God works through that principle. And God is wanting to work. So for example... If you were to walk off the top of a building without a parachute, gravity will come into play. 
It doesn't, doesn't matter. You are going to get hurt. The problem is, is we are walking aimlessly in life, not realizing that we're going to walk off the edge. We can't see the edge. We can only see where we are. We haven't planned and we haven't taken precautions for things that could happen. And that's what they do. If you're into business, if you're into business, you do a business plan and you and your wise, you take into consideration what if this doesn't go the way I want it to do? If I do this, what are the outcomes? What are the possible negatives? You're looking at them things because why? You can be planning ahead and think, okay, my staff might walk out. What will I do? Okay, I'll go get to, down to Destiny Church and get a few guys. Whatever it might be, well, you've got a plan. You've got to foresee. You've got to look. So you do that in business. Why not do it with your own life? Which is more important, the business or your life? I know which God says is more important because your business will not last for eternity and I don't care how good it is. The only thing that will you take with you into eternity is yourself. And so we need to concentrate on those things. Amen? So anyway... What I want to get to <laughs> is I want to tell the story of two young men. Two young men. The first young man is a young man that's on a path, but he doesn't realize he's on a path. And he has been seen to be on this path. And the person watching knows that they're on a path. But this young man hasn't got a clue and he's living in the now. The second young man is a man who understands his purpose and he understands God's plan for his life and he is living in light of how he wants his story of his life to be lived. Now the first young man is found in Proverbs chapter 7. <laughs> so if you turn to Proverbs chapter 7, we're going to read a story about a young man told by Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, obviously apart from Jesus. But he was the, was the wisest man. He's, not, he's, he's down for that. But he had to, uh, he was watching a young man out of the window. And so in the midst of this, while I'm telling this story, and when you're going through this, I want you to keep in, in mind, what story do you think the young man should have been thinking in his life? Should he have been asking this question uh, to himself? And if so, why? You answer those kind of questions. Because our decisions and what we do affects future generations. So, for example, when my mom and dad made a decision to follow Jesus, it affected mine and my sisters uh, and, it, and, my, and my daughters. So what I'm saying is it changed the trajectory of our life. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for a decision they made and an ongoing decisions that they committed to. So they made commitments, never missing church, never, never, stop, not, never not giving, and, and do you know what I mean? And, and contributing and getting involved. So what I'm saying to you is their decisions, which I had no control over, as much as I might cry about some of their decisions, I had no control over, but today I reap the benefit of their decisions. And you're maybe sat here today knowing that you have benefited from your parents' decisions, but it may be that your parents have made decisions and you are suffering as a consequence of their decision. It, is, it, it, it isn't just a good path. It could be good or bad, the outcome of it. Okay? So the first young man, Proverbs 7, um, is, uh, is this. And we'll read from verse 6 and we'll just nip through it. At the window of my house... This is Solomon talking. I looked out through the lattice. I saw among the simple. I noticed among the young men a youth who lacked judgment. Now you're thinking, well, he's only watching this young man passes from window. How does he know that he is lacking judgment? Well, there is a key, and that is because all youths lack judgment. And the reason that they lack judgment for has been shown scientifically now that they're not developed fully in their frontal lobes and so they don't have the ability to actually to reason things out properly. The skills are not fully formulated and so it's, there's a development going on. So in other words, that's why youths take risks that when you're older you wouldn't consider. 
Yes? So in other words, when I was young, not long ago, when I was young and I used to be on my motorbike, I had no thoughts of risk. And my thinking was, I'm happy to die on my motorbike. I, yeah? Now, as a result of that, I did some very dangerous and very stupid things, which if you want to know about that story in my life, um, then, no. Um, but we have, we have, what I'm saying is we have, that's a chapter in my life that I don't want to, to kind of think through. Do you know what I'm trying to say? But there were consequences as a result of that, and that consequence was often that my bike would need repairing and mum would have to do me washing. <laughs> Thing, how do they connect? Well, I could explain, but, uh, but mum was always the one there. So this is what he's doing. So he's just, he's, Solomon's ac acknowledging this is a young man, so basically he's not got a lot of sense, yes? And so we understand why they get engaged in high-risk activities, because they don't think about their choices and the consequences. And then verse 8 goes on. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. Here's a guy who knows where he's going. <coughs> he's heading in the direction of this woman. He already knows that she's married. He knows that her husband is away, but he's confident that he's going to have a night to remember. He's going to have a night that's going to be exciting and a night full of passion. Because for him, the night is disconnected from every other event in his life. He is not thinking that this is part of my story and will affect my story in years to come. But you see, Solomon knew when he saw this young man and where he was heading, he didn't see it as alive. Solomon knew it was a path that he was on. And so often, when you and I were looking on at other people, we see that it's a path. But when it's in ourselves, we often don't see the obvious. And so verse 10, it goes on. It says, Then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is loud and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. She took hold of him and kissed him with a brazen face. And she said, this is fascinating, I have fellowship offerings at home. Today I fulfilled my vows. That is a really odd thing to say, isn't it? We don't fully understand that. But basically, her doing this fellowship offering was like her going to church and going to confession booth and saying, okay, I've been doing wrong. Um, and uh, saying so many, whatever, Hail Marys, whatever, I, I want to be forgiven, I've, I've done wrong. But then she's come out, and now she wants to fill her sin bucket again. In other words, now we Protestants do the same, um, except we just miss out the confessional. We just go straight to the boss, and we say, and, and we're taught, if you, if, you, if you say you're sorry, God will rub it all out and clean your slate. And so what does that mean? That means, oh, I'm free to go and do things again. That's... That's so often what people think that they can do, not understanding that it's a path, that it's going. So in other words, she's trying to say to this young man, look, I've done this. I've got myself sorted with God. I'm not a hooker. I don't need the money. It's you I want. Can you imagine that guy going, me, me, she wants. It's not my money. It's nothing else. And of course, that's what, she, what, what he does, you see. But so often... <coughs> we miss it. So verse 15. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you and have found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, alloys, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. And then as if it needs an explanation, it says, my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. So this guy's thinking, I've just hit the jackpot. He's thinking, I don't, I don't have to just another night. I can stay for breakfast. I can watch TV. I can, there's, there's, there's no rush to, to, go, to go anywhere. But that's from his perspective. But you see, Solomon's perspective, watching this guy, this is what he says in verse 21. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She 
seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter. I'm sure he's thinking, I'm going to be like a celebrity. I'm going to have people go, oh, you imagine what I do. I'm going to be able to tell my mates all about this. Then he got to carry his own, like a deer stepping into a noose. Till an arrow pierces his liver. We've got blood and guts everywhere. Like a bird darting into a snare. Little knowing it will cost him his life. An event that he sees is a path for Solomon. And we fail to see that the event is a path. But if we can be wise, if we can change our thinking, if we can look differently at life and the events in life, can you imagine how much heartache it will save us? And so, having said that, and made the thing, this guy's throwing his future out, then Solomon turns to his audience, which is you and me. And then he says this, Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Why? Because it is a path. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are like a mighty throng, like a mighty crowd, yes? You see, what was a unique experience for this young man was actually a well-trodden path for thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. In other words, it wasn't uncommon. It wasn't... Uh, uncommon it was but to him he thought it was just a one-off thing and then driving home the point Solomon says in verse 27 her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death it's a highway it's a four-lane motorway with a hard shoulder in other words it's it's the broad way and he, he, we know where it is going and so often in life we say, I want to be richer in my relationships and yet choose a different path. Oh, I'll be faithful when I get married. Oh, when this happens, I'll do this. When that happens, whatever. But we are on a path. You see, it is nothing new for us that we all have a predisposition for choosing the wrong paths. That's, that's the problem. Now come to the second young man. The second young man is a guy called Joseph. Now, you, maybe most of you will have heard of Joseph, and some of you could probably tell the story better than I could ever tell the story. But he is living in 1800 BC. Uh, he's aged about 17 years of age. He's the 11th of 12 sons, but he is dad's favorite. Anybody here that's dad's favorite? <laughs> yes. But, you know, his brothers were jealous of him, they decided to kill him, um, and, and, and then they lost their nerve, and so they decided to sell him into slavery. They sold him into slavery, and they then went back to their dad and told a lie. So they went back to dad and said, oh, an animal must have done. We found his coat of many colors, and uh, there's blood on it, because they'd killed an animal to make it look like that, so they had conspired together. So now they have a story in their life that they can't go back on and change that is there for them and haunts them for the rest of their life. So a lie becomes a life destination for them. So they tell dad. So he's sold and he's auctioned and Potiphar, as we know, a military officer, um, buys him and he gets to work in his household. Now he has two options. He could either run and he could say, or, or he could say, well, I'm not going to really, I'm a slave. I'm going to do the least possible I could possibly do. Or he could choose to stay and he could choose to put his heart into it. And that's what he does. Now, remember, none of this is his fault. It's not his fault that his, so, that his brothers sold him into slavery. It's not his problem. But in other words, sometimes in life, and you might be in a situation like this, is where your life is hijacked by other people. Some things in your life happen that are out of your control, that you have no say over, that you feel manipulated. Um, you are, and, and, you know, in this, this situation, uh, he couldn't go anywhere. But Joseph decides to serve Potiphar's house 
as if it was his own, yes? And Potiphar notices him and notices how good he is, and so he makes him in charge of everything. And when he's in charge of everything, then, of course, it brings the attractions of, uh, of his wife. Now, there is a theme here, <laughs> but it's not meant to be. It's not a, an anti-women thing, but it is just the way the text shows it. But he could have, he could have, uh, he had a story up to this point. But Potiphar's wife insists that he becomes her lover. Now, she might have had many lovers, we don't really know. But J- J- um, Joseph had two options. And in actual fact, neither of them were good options. Neither of them were options that actually would have had a good outcome. For the simple reason, it wasn't just a moral issue, it was a life and death issue. For the simple reason, Potiphar could have him killed either way. But you know what? He chose to go and have a better story. And what I find noticeable here is Joseph chooses to actually to, to employ a technique that actually would be good for you and I to take on board this technique. It's quite an unusual technique normally, but he does that and we see it in the text. And that is that Joseph rehearses his story to Potiphar's wife. In other words, he's setting up his life story for her to hear so that she can hear the context of his decision. That's, wow, you think, yeah? So that's what, what, what he does. In other words, so his decision is made in the context of the story he wants. And he says this in, paraphrased, he says, Mrs. Potiphar, I came to this land as a slave. I had no rights, no future. Your husband purchased me. I did my best to serve him. Through hard work and God's help, I've gained the trust of your husband. He's put me in charge of the entire household. Now let's read the text, Genesis 39. Verse 8, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. In other words, he's saying to her as well as to himself is, is this affair what you want to have in the story of your life. He's, in other words, he's not just saying no, he's explaining and saying, look, in the context of this, why spoil what, what, what I have and what you have? And then verse 9, he says, then, how then could I do such a wicked thing and perspective and sin against God? It wasn't a sin against, um, uh, uh, against um, the guard, the military guard Potiphar, but it was against God. And that's because God determines it. And so it's important for us to understand that there are responses, our decisions that make the difference in a story and whether that story ends good or ends badly. Now, he gets thrown into prison as a result of doing the right thing. And sometimes when we do the right thing, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like right. So in other words, your boss asks you to lie. And, um, and you could have these two options. One is you could lie, and let's say that then, you, because you've lied, um, the person that you've lied to finds out, and so your boss uh, isn't willing to back you up, and then you end up losing your job. So now you're a liar, and you've lost your job. But on the other one, you could actually you say, no, I'm not lying for you, in which case you could have still lost your job. But now you're not a liar and lost your job, you've just lost your job. Can you understand the context of how this works? And so Joseph... Several years later, where he wins the favor of the, of the warden, because once again, he's working like Billy O, doing everything he can, even though he's in a place that he doesn't want to be. It's not part of his life plan. It's not where uh, he, he thinks uh, the, the thing. But he cannot see the end, but God does. And we've got to understand God sees where we're going to go. He sees the pit. He sees the prison. And he sees where we are going to go. Now, he is several years later... He is ushered into Pharaoh's presence to interpret a dream. Now, none of his magicians and none of the people that were in the palace could interpret this. And so he said, well, Pharaoh says, I understand you interpret dreams because he'd interpreted the dreams of others in prison. And as a result of that, he says, so I've got this, this dream and I need you 
to interpret it. And then Joseph says something that I'm not sure I would have said. But Joseph said, well, I can't interpret dreams neither. I don't know if you'd have done that. But he said, but my God can. Which actually is a dangerous thing to say to, uh, to, to say to Pharaoh. And the reason it's dangerous to say to Pharaoh, because he thought he was God. So can anybody say, no, but my God, you're by implication. So he could have, he could have come a cropper at that. Um, but anyway, he goes on. And so he interprets the, the dream, does Joseph, and uh, says there's going to be seven years of good. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be an outpouring of harvest. The grain is just going to be... But then there's going to be seven years of famine and people are going to forget completely and utterly about, uh, about this. And, uh, and so that's what he did. But then when he finished the dream, Joseph didn't just leave it there. This is what's fascinating. is He says something here which is really unthinkable. He decides to give Pharaoh some advice. Can you imagine that he's there probably still smelling of the dungeon And there he is, and a foreigner, giving Pharaoh some advice. And this is what he told Pharaoh. He said, somebody needs to wake up and every day focus on preparing for Egypt because of what's coming. So choose somebody foolish. No, choose somebody wise, somebody you can trust and put them in charge. And then hold your breath. What does Pharaoh say? Well, who's wiser and more able than you? Now, he didn't say that because he wanted the job, but he got the job and became the prime minister of the greatest nation on earth as a result of following through and being bold and courageous and making the right decisions. And he finishes. Genesis 41, he talks in verses 38 to 40, he talks about that. And he talks about how, um, you know, Pharaoh Pharaoh does that. But in this, what you find is that eventually his brothers have to come to Egypt because there's famine. And they come and they meet Joseph, but they don't know it's Joseph. And Joseph recognizes them. And then to cut a long story short, he eventually reveals who he is and they are terrified because they think that now that he's going to take revenge and he's going to do to them what they did to him. But Joseph doesn't react to them. He responds with his story. A story of where he wants things to think. He is not like them. He is different to them. And so when he reveals his identity for them, this is what uh, uh, he says there. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a bridge against us? This is Genesis 50. Against us. And pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. And so they're trying to convince Joseph not to do anything bad to him. And then verse 18, it says, his brothers came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves. They are petrified of what he will do because of his power and his prestige and everything that he has. But Joseph said to them this, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And verse 20 is one that's worth memorizing if you're able to do. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done to the saving of many lives. Who knows what will happen in your life if you choose to take the wise road, if you choose to think, what story do I want to be told? What story do I want to tell to my children and my grandchildren as a result of this decision? Because this decision is not in isolation to the rest of my life. I've got, I'm on a course and I'm on a path. And I pray that today that you really would take this to heart and, um, and, and, and do that. Because... Jesus changed history because of his story. Jesus made history and he wants to be involved in your story because of what he did. He had a choice. He didn't have to do what he did. But Hebrews 12 says, but for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. 
In other words, even though there's pain in the now, and I don't like, and Father, take it away if you can, but he says, but because of what I see ahead into eternity, the many hundreds and millions of people that will say yes and have salvation and be in the family of God, all because today I'm willing to say no to self and yes to you. Will you do that for him today? Amen.